Okay, I'll call this regular school board meeting, Argus Schools, to order at 7 o'clock. And we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. O'Dell's agreed to start us off. Of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will follow with a moment of Channel 50, ABC 57 is on their way here so not to attend our board meeting, which they'd be very welcome if they were here to attend our board meeting. But with the fire in Paris of the cathedral, uh, we got students here and a parent here that were just there 13 days ago, and ABC 57 wants to talk about them and their experiences. So when they come, we'll probably stop the meeting for about a minute to put a fit Channel 57 and our kids together, and then we'll go on ahead. But, I don't, they said they'll come at 7, they're, obviously they're not here yet, so <laughs> just explaining what's going on and nothing out of the ordinary except they want to talk to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number three, we'll move into communication from patrons. So anyone who would like to uh, address the board. Yes. I'm Ginger Calhoun, community member, retired from here, 39 years. Um, as you know, in the last, or somebody may not know, in the last two weeks in the state legislature, uh, the funding for schools is still not set. They pulled the 13th stipend check from retirees last Thursday. Tomorrow there's going to be a rally at the State House, uh, Indiana PTA, Concerned Indiana Legislators, AFT, ISTA, all in support at 3 p.m. South Atrium of the State House. Uh, keynote speaker is Dr. Jennifer McCormick. Uh, we need to work really, really hard. I am one of the local Marshall County people that are helping schools and community uh, to do something if, with the state legislature with the lengthy break that teachers were out and making contact with Brenda. I thought it was best I just came in tonight. Uh, some schools have had school board members. And you're, you're fine. I just need to. That's fine. Superintendents that have come down to the first rally or who have did resolutions in support of improved funding for schools. Right now the House is looking at 2.1 and 2.2 first and second year. The Senate is looking at 2.7 first year and 2.2. The governor supports the 2%. We all know that's not enough. There's no way that we can stay with inflation at those rates. Um, we need to put uh, pressure on key individuals. Uh, Senator Mishler is from Bremen, and he's chair of the Appropriations Committee, so any contact to him would be greatly appreciated, along with uh, Senator Randy Head and uh, Representative Jack Jordan. Uh, lots is going to have to happen in the next two weeks, and you know, you can't give what the state doesn't provide for. I was not in favor when the state took over the funding of schools from property taxes. Everybody thought it was great. You know, want everything out in the same pool because they're problems. So, hopefully, uh, that you encourage teachers that you support the fact that this is important to all of us and to keeping our small rural school uh, with some of the things that the state is dealing with. And I sure wish that you would make calls, uh, do a resolution, do anything you can in the next uh, 14 days. Uh, to help encourage the state to do the right thing. We all know the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And while the Senate has taken a lot of money away from some of the charter programs, the House has reinserted it. That so is correct. Yes. It has been one of those things. I've been down there four times. I'm heading back tomorrow. I'm heading to a phone call that corresponds with this meeting time 
Uh, but we just need everybody, superintendent, the school board. To be I do need to say, board, the superintendent's association is in full agreement, and so is the school board association from the state of Indiana. So really all the educational institutions are agreeing with what you're saying. Right. So to address the state legislature. Anything we can do to get publicity, uh, to get the word out in the next two weeks is going to be essential because remember, it's a biennium budget. What we get this year, while they might tweak it next year, you know, in the short session, they don't want to deal with that. So it that won't means be significant. It, it will not be significant. So that puts us two years down before we can hope for a better. So thank you for your time. Thank you all, you and the audience it's from Argus that I know, you know, do whatever you can to help and make this improvement. And I'm going to leave because I'm going to be on a conference call. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Senator Mishler, Senator Head, and Jack, Jack Jordan. Jordan. Jack Jordan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank night. you. Any other communication out there from our patrons? Okay, item number four, uh, approval of minutes. We have uh, three sets of minutes. Work session for March 18th, the regular board meeting on March 18th, and the executive session from March 18th. That was a nice long evening, wasn't it? Yes, it was a long evening, but the weather was better than the month before when we had the ice storm. Right. Okay, so I'd entertain a motion to accept those three sets of minutes. A motion. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, moved and seconded to accept the approval of the minutes. Uh, do we have any discussion or questions? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries 4-0. Is Angie voting on the phone or is she just listening? No, she's... She's just monitoring our... Okay. Our policies say that you have to be present in person to, to vote. vote. Yeah. But she can give all kind, any input she wants to give and ask any questions right. she needs. So. Are you still with us, Angie? Yeah, I'm All right. So, so our policy doesn't allow the conference call to count towards a quorum either then? No, probably not, issue. right. Okay. Now, those could be edited some days, but as of today, that's mm -hmm. what our policy right. says. We discussed that this afternoon. Technology may change that down the road. Yes. So far, it's not been a problem. we got to get the state of Indiana to move on some of these issues, too. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, item five, uh, personnel changes. We only have one listed. It is on the screen. Is that Monica L Langenheader? I'm not yes. sure how that's pronounced. And okay. uh, as a full-time custodian, uh, we had a custodian retire, and this is a replacement position. Mm -hmm. We'd recommend approval. Okay, and that's the only personnel change. Okay, do we have a motion to that effect? Okay. Thank you. And a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, any questions on the employment full time custodian? Okay. All in favor with an aye? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion carries 4 0. Okay. Item 6 uh, Qualified energy service and roof replacement, restoration. And I think I'm going to turn this over to Ned. Okay. Uh, board, we're going to have some presentations this evening and some discussions, and we've already worked on this some in a work session, been sharing information, but I want to share with the community and everybody uh, some proposed projects for the future and making Argus schools secure for the future, and uh, we want to look at some of this, and which will help us with some of our needs, and also... Um, we don't hear anything else all evening of all the presentations. We are wanting to improve our schools, actually make some money off of this, and no tax increase. That's sort of the bottom line. So we're going to share some information this evening. Board will consider this many times in the next few months. It'll come up in public hearings and all this. So this is more of an introduction tonight and time for the board to ask questions. Uh, it's really not an open time for the community to ask questions, but it is to open for the board to ask questions. Community, if you have questions, please, you know where I'm at. Give me a call and we'll get answers to your questions. So, first of all, Johnson Mellow Solutions are here. They're uh, energy providers, energy savings providers, guaranteed energy saving contracts. And Doug Copley and Craig Martin, they're here to present. They've done this at many, many schools around the state of Indiana and towns and even Indianapolis Airport, among other things. So, I don't know which one of you are first, Doug, Craig, whoever. Jump in. 
Okay, welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. Today. Welcome to Argus. Thank you. Um, on tax day, it's, it is good to be able to talk about something without the taxing. No, we're not. <laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone's looking to increase their taxes exactly. right now. Exactly, exactly. So thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Doug Copley, and I'll, I'll try to highlight just some of the things we, we discussed in 30,000 feet, and then certainly the questions um, ask away. Um, Craig's been around a lot longer than I have. He's a gentleman who looks a lot of work. So, uh, <laughs> I'll let you guys argue. Freshly, uh, fresh back from Florida. And uh, um, I've been around long enough. I, I was involved with the roof project here got almost 20 years ago. So I feel like it's sometime I know the Argus buildings. You've been on a roof. Better than our kids. Our and, yes. you know, so a lot of, lot of familiarity with, with the history. Um, we're part of a large... Uh, Energy, as, as Mr. Spiker said, energy savings company. Uh, we do work pretty much all around the country anymore, um, based out of Indianapolis. And uh, if you've ever flown out of Indianapolis, um, the big solar project, if you see all those solar panels down there, that's us. And it's, uh, it's a monster solar project. But the, their intent was basically the same as Mr. Spiker, to reduce energy costs for the airport. So. Um, I'll, I'll hit just kind of the highlights. We've we've done solar, and, and especially especially here where where um, space is a consideration, where we don't we don't want to put necessarily solar panels on the ground, and, and so we look for alternative spaces to, to do it. And uh, I've been involved with roofing for way too many years and way too many gray hairs, but actually we we advocate putting them on the roof to kind of get them away from everyday site and, and uh, to have basically keep the soccer fields in place and, and not disrupt any of the any of the sports fields <coughs> and as I say we've done we've done projects all over all over the state um, Indianapolis Airport is a, is a monster it's a 77 acre um, project down there and again anytime you fly out of India you'll you'll see it and and part of our capabilities is basically anything to do with with energy savings and safety um, could be safety audits, could be um, intruder access points, this type of thing, down to lighting uh, controls, every, every bit of, of energy savings. The mechanical side, the, the chillers, the boilers, the things that nobody really likes to address, but they're kind of the guts of the operation to keep, keep the buildings going, especially when it's 20 below out in the, uh, in the winter. Um, and then roofing. And uh, part of the biggest thing is when you do look at solar, especially on a roof, um, the roofs have to be taken care of, and um, and that's probably the my biggest attribute is making sure that's done right, so there there aren't roof issues down the road or leaks or, or finger pointing of whose whose issue is that, right? Um, so really, what we're looking at um, between solar and then what we would call a, a natural gas micro turbine, and I'll get more into this in a minute, but uh, those are kind of the two energy savings areas as we've noticed. And we'd sat down with Mr. Spiker and said, okay, what are some of the district headaches, right? What are the, the big trouble spots within the district? And I believe as Ginger's just eloquently said, right, the, the funding formula, probably a lot of us would agree, is it's, it's, it's very tough right now. It's getting tougher. Schools just don't have the revenue. The tax base is, is very challenging. And, and the state or the Indianapolis group is, uh, especially the legisl legislature, is making it tougher and tougher each year for us to to fund projects and to do really anything besides day-to-day -day operations. So what we looked at was um, basically a way um, to not only, we, we backed up, we looked at all the utility bills for the past two years and, and Patty was huge and a big help on that and we appreciate it, but to analyze all the utility bills and analyze especially the roofs and the roofs from even almost 20 years ago are coming out of warranty, uh, six of them in particular. So we've tried to figure out a way to incorporate those roofs into, um, into the overall project and to be able to put solar panels up on those roofs once they've been uh, rehabilitated and restored. Then the solar can go up on top. And uh, so that's the number one, basically rehabilitate the six roofs that are coming out of the warranty. And then number two would be to install uh, solar panels, 665 solar panels on top of those Three, three of the six roofs and incorporate an integrated warranty so that the warranty is tied together. So there's no finger pointing. It's, it's, if there is an issue, it's, it's one phone call, not two or three or ten. And what we would do then is put uh, on the green roofs, those are the roofs that are coming out of warranty, 
and on those green sections they would all be restored, rehabilitated, and then the solar would be the blue, and they're going up on the three roofs that they would advocate they would so be two, two of the gym bays, and gym one, and gym two, and the auditorium. Exactly. Can you click back to that? Oops, sorry. So they can sort of get a feel, and that would show the roofs that need some attention that would be brought up to the standards we need to protect us in the future. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's one of those things where even if even if nothing was done with solar or anything else, they'd still need to be we, done. We need to do this in the roofs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we yeah. can't have our roofs going. Yeah, and our, our thought was, Let's take advantage of nice, big, clean roofs that are wide open and put them up there once they've been restored. And that's, that way it'll coincide with the 20-year the 20 year warranty. And, and here's the, the interesting point I think that Ginger brought up and that um, Mr. Spiker mentioned that probably the biggest challenge is the operating budget, right? That's the one where, uh, unfortunately now, with, with CPF budgets hardly exist anymore, it, everything is dumped into that operating budget transportation, maintenance, everything else. And so really what, what we try to do is come up with a energy savings approach that would become cash flow positive as quick as possible. And that's what the solar microturbine would do. And oops, I apologize here. Um, examples of the of the cash flow would be $56,000 positive in year one. And then you can see samples throughout. Uh, basically, we just picked a 25 year historical base, but it would ramp up 78,000 99,000, et cetera, et cetera. But that would go right into the operating budget that then you team as a board and Mr. Spiker can determine all right, how, how's the best way we should utilize this. And then I'll play a, just a, just a quick way to hit. We need Patty to set that up. Do I hit like a, yeah, just click on the video. We should make a very bottom, quick little. It's like a three-minute overview okay. from Sharon, if we can get her to get on the plate. An example of the school district about here we go. There we go. Size range, yes. Mm -hmm. Oop. Hey, and there it is. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> this one will be tough for Angie to see, but right. yeah, yeah, Angie, I have a little trouble seeing this one, but she can see it another time. The school board and the community have both had a big part of the decisions we made. Uh, one, we had an initial discovery, you know, we did our research to find out as much as we could about solar, and so we did that part first, and then secondly, we approached the school board with this idea. Um, after showing the positive environmental impact, as well as a positive fiscal impact, the school board enthusiastically helped us take the next steps. It didn't take long at all for us to look at the cost of this, and the impact it would have for our school district and our board was like this is a no-brainer this is something that we should just go ahead and go with we've had johnson miller here several times giving presentations to the different grade levels we've had you know different grades do different research projects on it you know our students make the comments on how we've changed lights and how we've changed doors and how we've made the place uh, upgraded everything we could in the district so we're happy when we hear the students are happy uh, schools are always looking for ways to, to best maximize their dollars and not pass on tax increases to their to their constituents and I think this is a, an awesome way to do it. I've already trumpeted that to several other school corporations that are looking into wind or solar. By the way, that's Tony Cook. For Sheridan, by doing this project, we are now able to lock in our prices and know that that's that's going to be a set amount for at least, like I said, for the next 20 years. But we also appreciate the fact, too, that John Zamello has reached out and their representatives are coming in and giving lessons to our students and to our teachers. So the biggest advantage we've had besides just the fiscal part of it is the educational part. And let's face it, we're a school system. So we want to make sure that the education is tied into everything we do around here. And more than any project we've done in the last couple of years, this has been the best example of us being fiscally sound and also expanding education for our students. Uh, it allows them to do economically a great thing to be able to shift resources to the classroom. That's huge when you have a small school corporation and being able to shift those those funds into people that are the primary and most important asset you have in your school. 
Anybody considering by looking at the budget and the rising cost of utilities, I would have anybody, whether it's school, business, anything, um, to really look into something like putting solar in, just because from what we saw with our books and the payout that it, it will have and the impact it'll have, I mean, this locks us in with our utility costs for the next at least 20 years, they're saying. And knowing that that amount is locked in and we don't have to worry about that for 20 plus years, we're excited because now we have funds to put back into the classrooms and help the teachers. This project, through the assistance of, of Duke, Johnson Mellon, and several people, has been about as easy a project we've ever, it's one of the biggest, but also one of the easiest projects we've undertaken here over the last couple of years. I'm glad to see that Indiana is stepping it up and getting into the to this, this phase of the technology. Thank you. Yeah, that, it's always good when, uh, when they were net zero, so it's basically a complete offset, but uh, similar to what we're talking about here and the fact that uh, the technology and the education really become the, uh, the key components. And in, in, as Dr. Mundy, when he was at Sheridan, said, the education piece is, is really important. And you guys, I'm sure, with grandchildren and kids, um, I get it from my grandchild, grandson now asking about solar alternative energy. So that's one big piece that we can, we can bring to is that education. The achieve. educational component's huge. As we look at our students in the future and the world they're going to be living in uh, using renewable energy, but the big asset is, is it really secures the financial stability as far as we can see in the future of the school district. Exactly. Exactly. That's a huge piece of that. Yeah, and that's why I threw in just a couple of a uh, couple of fun facts that solar is supposed to grow just hand over fist really through 2050, and then uh, I don't know why it would slow down because I think more and more people are, are getting into it. Residential now is starting to you see them popping up in neighborhoods, people's homes, on farms, about everywhere you look, and, and basically it, it's it's interesting because it's uh, offsetting you know, 73 million. Tons of CO2 each year, which is just you know, probably the biggest. Um, when you look at the trees and you look at cars off the road, anything we can do from a, from a carbon footprint standpoint, so it, it's it's huge. And um, uh, like I mentioned, I, I teach a, a class over at Homestead High School, and same type of thing. That's what we huge end of it is, is educating the staff, educating the kids to where uh, they can make it fun talking about a science or a math class and. and basically use it more than just looking at what it's doing on a given day. So anyway, um, uh, Mr. Spiker just asked, you know, we uh, we can really help with the full process. I think probably the roofing is the biggest piece that needs to be done during the summer. That's the most obtrusive to you guys and to the kids and, and staff. But uh, besides that, everything else can be can function later on in the fall. And really, the roofing drives it, I think. The roofing would be the first if the board yes. proceeds with this proposal, yes. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, come on. It's a good song. Good. Now it'll play. Here comes the sun, right? A little bit more music. But uh, thank you. I wanted to at least want to give you the board. Board, any uh, questions for Doug and Craig? Uh, I mean, you've had a chance to look at this before. But if you have any, there'll be plenty of opportunities in the future as you consider this. but. Uh, just want to make the first introduction. Craig, do you have anything you want to share with the board? I'm here to support any questions. You just came to visit us, right? Yeah, it's a good drive up here. <laughs> so we're in the middle of April. Could we still get on a schedule for a summer roof? Yeah, I think if, uh, yeah, if and Damien will talk about the finance. Damien's going to talk about yeah. that. And yeah. One thing we can do, and as you go through looking at the funding of this, uh, we could also proceed and we could pay it out of some of our other accounts. We do that and then reimburse ourselves later on. Because really, there's, I'm going to talk about three different components here. And some of it's got to be done during summer when we're not really in school. Um, we really don't want kids around doing some of it. But some of it could be done after school starts. And really, the, the solar part of it could be done wouldn't affect the educational process. But putting redoing our roofs and that's a little different and we're going to talk about some other things that we will have to do when school is not in session right yeah. well it's probably the best part and the biggest message to bring is that I, I do a lot of school board meetings where you talk about roofs in general and not many times can you say hey we're going to do a roof project without taxes or affecting taxes and so that's the biggest message is 
Yeah, no tax increase. Biggest message is we can do this, yeah. not impact our taxes, and actually have a return on this as time goes by. Yes. Do you want to touch just briefly on, I don't think the community has heard it, the guaranteed portion through yeah. the state of Indiana. Sure, Craig, do you want to get done? Yeah, I can address that. Um, we are a qualified energy savings provider for the state of Indiana doing public projects including K through 12, cities, towns, municipalities. Under state statute, we guarantee solar power production and energy savings back to the public entity. So really, from a pure risk standpoint to the school, we underwrite all the savings that we generate. So uh, we provide a bond for that. So even if um, you know we fall short on our savings projections, some didn't come out as much, what have you, we still underwrite that back to the school to make sure that the school is whole. So, so the school is guaranteed the return it falls on the company if it doesn't perform. That's right. Now I've also asked Craig how many times over the years have you not performed? Yeah, we perform. We get our numbers on the solar production. And he says if it's not working, we'll be here fixing it to make sure it's working because absolutely you don't want to leave us short and you've exceeded projections on all your projects. We have. And yes, yes. I like the sound of that. Yeah, one thing I want to add uh, yes. is a great question on scheduling. One thing I would like to say, when you look at roof and you look at solar, you know, what we like to do is install solar either in the summer into the fall of the year, because once we get the system tweaked and so forth through the winter, we are ramping up in the spring. You know, once the sun gets high in the sky, we're producing as much as we can versus doing a late winter, early spring, summer project, we're missing an awful lot of the savings potential coming out of the box. So it's really important if the board is interested in the project, getting the roofing done, to your point, as early in the summer as we can, following up with solar to get that installed, get it tweaked, commissioned. So we're coming out spring 2020, producing as much as we can. Financially would be a big benefit to the community schools. Good. Other questions, board, for Craig or Doug, as we begin this journey? Thank you. I think, board, um, you received that information, and that pretty well concludes item six on our agenda for now. We'll come back and talk about it later. Um, Bonnie, if you want to do number seven, okay. they will give you an update on that. And, All right. Patty's going to try to give me a slide on that, I think. Okay. I got good news on that, but not final news, so I'll share that with the board. Okay, I'll just mention that the board did have a chance to ask a lot of questions when we met with these gentlemen before. And we did ask quite a few at that time. During your work, during <laughs> during the work, work session. session. Yeah. Right. They rolled up their sleeves and got their questions <laughs> Okay, item number seven, uh, drainage study report. And uh, Patty's got... Oh, good. She's got a slide up. Yeah. Um, that clicker, does Doug still have it, or do you have it? Doug, if you bring that to me, I'll see if I can shoot long range here. <laughs> uh, board, I'm waiting on a final report from Kramer Association, Kramer Associates on our drainage. Um, I know what they want to do. I've had conversations. They said they'd send me the final report yet, and I'll proceed to get. But we'll talk about that. Um, board is aware we have some drainage problems on the north side of our building, basically the elementary playground, and I guess it's right in this area here. Actually got a big hill here, comes down towards the school, mm -hmm. and over the years this parking lot here, or this asphalt, has slanted towards the school. So every time we get significant rains, it all slams into the school. We've had problems flooding some classrooms, and we've had problems uh, filling our tunnel tunnels with water that is doesn't have a place to go it's not a real good situation so we looked at all options and the board you've had this a couple times but gonna not go into a lot of depth but originally when the school was built these drainage from off the roof and at this playground went in tile that went under the school and came out into the parking lot hooked into the town well, it's been a major study to figure out what those drainage problems are. We ran cameras down as far as we could go and hit dead ends and then we ran dye down these drains and what we found out is somewhere under our building all these are non-functioning whether they've collapsed uh, or what's happened 
The solution is is dig the whole school up, which is not a good solution, or find another route to get rid of the drainage. Well, there's a manhole cover about right here, and there's about six manhole covers here that really look good. But when they got in and studied those, all of those don't have any pipes exiting them. They're just dry wells. And that doesn't help us a whole lot. So in meeting with the town, meeting with contractors, and meeting with Kramer Associates, and we studied going around to the north and to the west, clear out past our soccer fields, past our soccer stadium, to the town park, to the wetlands. Well, that's a long way to go, and that's a major cost to pipe that all the way out there. And the town really doesn't have anything to the west and to the north to hook on to. So that is not cost effective. And if we went that way, the town says we'd have to put in detention ponds to hold the water until they drain the neighborhoods. That's very expensive. So what do we do? Can't really rip up the school, can't really go that way. So then the latest meeting with the town and meeting with our engineers is running a line around the north end of the school. And if you look right here, sort of a area of a, we only have about 12 feet between our property and the, our property line and the school. But having contractors here, they say it's very doable to run a drain line there. And the town says, if we go this way, we can hook up down here and to an existing line to, dr to drain it out. And that's the most feasible. That's what they're going to recommend. That's what they're going to write up. But that's something to tear up the playground, put in that drainage, come around the north side of the building, hook into our parking lot to keep our school from flooding. And it's actually eroding the foundation of the school on the northeast corner. We've got to do it. So that would be a part of this project also. And that has to be done when school's not in session. We can't have open trenches and the playground torn up. And so that's something we'd be looking at that needs to occur this summer. Uh, we don't think it's a major cost item. It has to do it. Right there it says detention area. But when the engineers looked at it in the town, we don't have to do a detention area on our property because we're not adding new water. We're just restoring collapsed lines that were already there and so that's what's going to come from Kramer but I don't have their final report yet for it so I want to give you the scope of that and what it would go and that's what our recommendation is going to say um, all the videos in of all our lines all the die tests are in all the town is met on it and everything's good we just need that recommendation written up and as soon as I get that board I'll be sharing that with you any questions on that. And I also get the engineers here to tell you a little more officially than I can. But that's what they've been working on. In order to get that. Yes, Angie. Yes. They didn't get any seepage through at all on the dye test. They got some seepage around to the north and to the west into those dry wells. The dye showed up there, but they couldn't get any dye to come underneath the school into the manhole covers in front of the school. The lines itself goes underneath the tunnels even, and they don't feel like that's an issue. They feel like they're just not functioning, and so all the roof drains are backing up onto our playground, which just multiplies the problem, because that water has nowhere to go. But that's a good question. But we will do due do, do diligence to make sure of that. But none of the dye came through, and they couldn't get the cameras through and the dye through when they tried it. Thank you. In order to uh, address this this summer, and since we don't have the actual report yet, so I assume we can't vote on anything, will we need a special meeting to it will fit, time wise? It will fit into our other meetings. Okay. And okay. so we're just talking about sort of the scope of this and introducing it tonight, and we'll just sort of start at motions and process. But we're still okay. Um, really, we need to probably act upon this at our next board meeting right. in order to get something done in June and July. But that's when we need to tear this up because after we get done, we'll have to fill all this in. We'll have to regrade the playground and uh, 
we don't need a bunch of mud out there with the kids come back. That would not be a good, good solution. <laughs> That's not a good mix. And, and open trenches would not, they'd have a ball, but their moms and the teachers would not have fun. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> so that's what I have on uh, number seven on our okay. drainage report. And no action necessary. No, no we're just okay. sharing information. Okay, item eight concerning the auditorium. Yes, we did a uh, feasibility study on our auditorium. When we did a feasibility study a year ago, we found our auditorium was not meeting state codes of changing codes. And we also noticed, that we knew that we cannot replace the integrated circuits there. You can't buy parts, they're 20 some years old. In fact, the state was made, this might be one of the oldest <coughs> computer systems they've seen operating in like 20 plus years. It's amazing, it's still working. I mean, it was taken great care of. But we need to upgrade, and we need to bring the auditorium up to code. So that would be a third part of this, as we're looking at, but David's gonna tell us the finances here in a little bit. But as we're looking at this, we need to address the auditorium. That doesn't have a summer immediacy to it. I mean, we can work in the auditorium in between productions, yes. Mm -hmm. And that can be done. And so the big thing is that once we touch that auditorium, we have to bring all the curtains up to fire code. None of our curtains meet Indiana code. They did when the thing was built. They served us well. I think it's 20 some years they've been there. But the code has changed, and the state will force us to bring, and that's that's a pretty good chunk of change. So we're looking at we have an estimate on the auditorium that's somewhere around 180 to 190 thousand dollars to bring the auditorium up to code, so we can continue to use it. Well, we've got a wonderful investment there and wonderful programs. We don't have much choice. By this energy project is a way to help fund this, and that's why we're bringing it to you. So. There's your three, really three or four components. We have the roofs, we have the energy project, we have the drainage concern, and we have the auditorium concern. And so board, we're gonna be starting, recommending starting a process in the next few months for you to consider all this. So I'm done sharing parts and pieces. Big part of this, well, how do you pay for it and how do you finance it, so. Which is, I think, the next item. Okay. Item number nine. Uh, funding for the proposed projects. Would you like to introduce Damien? Uh, d yes, this okay. is Damien Magos, and Damien is a financial consultant, and he's done a lot of work looking at Argus and how to do this efficiently for Argus, and I gave Damien, really I gave him one direction, find a way that we can do this, but you cannot raise taxes. <laughs> And he didn't fall over, and he came back and started talking to me. So he would like to share some information with you. Because I don't, we need to do this within our present tax structure. Sure. The question is, how do we do it, Damien? Um, thank you. Um, I put together a report that talks about funding. I didn't, I've got one. Next year, but I'm going to use this for. Use that, and you leave it, we'll make sure Angie gets it. Okay, yes. Yeah. Can that, I, what do you want me to. Okay. We're going to pull. Will the uh, lady be able to hear? Can you sure. hear Damien all right, Angie? Yeah. Or you can go like in the corner over there. Or Wherever you feel comfortable. Okay, well, I, I just want to make sure that she can. Holler her. if you can't hear or you need something, Angie, and we'll try to correct it. Okay, well, uh, before. Um, I started just a quick introduction. Um, you want I that? have been working. Red button. Well, gives you a pointer. Oh, okay. The other will move the slides for you. <laughs> if you don't want it, huh? Patty will take care of it. Just like chewing gum and walking. <laughs> <laughs> we got the so test. I may have to stop at this point. Yeah. We'll get there. Okay, so um, before I, um, I start just quickly, uh, I have been working um, in Indiana for over, oh gosh, nearly 30 years now. Long um, time. And, uh, and specifically as a financial consultant or advisor for uh, school corporations, K-12 schools, that's kind of my specialty. Um, and so um, I work, um, I'm an executive vice president for George K. Ballin and Company. I uh, actually manage the Indiana uh, a division for uh, GKB. Uh, I'm out of uh, Indianapolis, and we have an office up here uh, in Crown Point. 
and uh, one down in uh, Columbus, uh, Indiana. So there's uh, three individuals that specifically work in Indiana, and then there's uh, another six or seven support that uh, um, help us uh, here um, uh, in Indiana. There's a little bio on me uh, towards the end of um, the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, yeah. Before I start, just a couple of things uh, here. Whenever we get good news, you kind of share it. And we got good news this year. We are the number one financial advisor in the nation uh, when it comes to our short term paper, and that's uh, bond issues or uh, notes, etc., that are 10 years or less. And then we are sixth in the country um, when it comes to all. And that's uh, a Bloomberg statistic. It isn't anything that we uh, came up with this was uh, so um, the company is um, uh, a national firm that uh, uh, all we do is public finance uh, there is not, nothing else in the, the majority I'd say probably 70 75 percent of that is k-12 uh, financing it was funny uh, and I think the um, the state rep said it, I'm glad that uh, Indiana has finally um, uh, is looking into um, uh, renewable energy. Um, I remember a few years ago, Craig got a hold of me and said, We're looking at doing a project down in uh, southern Indiana. Uh, is this something that you do? And I said, Well, we have a renewable energy department that's been doing this for about 17 years. And it finally. So it's Indiana happened. finally came to the table. Huh? Well, yeah, because <laughs> it, uh, uh, that division is in New Mexico. Uh, and the sun shines a little more in New Mexico. Well, I, actually, it doesn't, does it? I think there's, I think I had heard a statistic or somebody had said that there's actually more days of sun than, it, it's just nicer out there. <laughs> <laughs> that part I know is true. Of sun, um, I think, am I, is that correct or who knows? Sure. <laughs> or someone give me a, a line. But, um, but yeah, no, it, uh, we've been financing uh, these types of projects for a very long time, and they and they have um, uh, finally entered here. Um, what's unique about this is that uh, they're typically financed. Um, so there was a I think there was a question, you know, the guaranteed energy you right. know, savings. So yeah, typically they would get financed from the savings. So if you had a hundred thousand dollars of savings, that savings went to pay the. Uh, the portion of the, you know, the project. And so you really didn't see, there were savings, but you didn't feel those savings until you paid the project off. And then it you know, kind of goes, yeah. you know, in terms That's of- That's when it comes real valuable yeah. to us. What's unique here is you're in a situation where you have debt that's coming off. And so you can actually do a bond issue that funds these projects, and I'll talk about that, um, that takes advantage of the debt that's coming off. So you're just kind of replacing and kind of filling in. So there would be no increase uh, in your debt service rate. And because these are being paid out of debt, the savings you're going to be able to see immediately. And that's in your operational fund you know, as early as you know, uh, next year or so when um, they turn the switch on and you, um, you're producing instead of paying up for the energy. So um, what I want to talk, just real quickly, because I think you've seen this, so I'm just going to real quickly go through this report. I want to take a look at your levy, your rate, then talk about um, the, um, uh, the legislative uh, uh, thresholds for uh, projects, um, talk about your gross assessed value, and then just look at an estimated budget. Uh, and then uh, estimated levy and uh, estimated uh, debt rate uh, for a new uh, possible project. This is what your current uh, levy looks like. Um, it's, uh, and, and I'm, I'm signaling out 2018 because that was kind of the, the top year that kind of dropped a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Really, you've got the uh, 14 GO bonds. There's uh, uh, 2006, 2008, and then uh, 11 and 17 bond issues. Um, that debt service levy of 906,000, that maximum levy is um, what is line one of your 16 line budget. So everything, all the numbers you're gonna see here, you're gonna be able to go, oh, that's where that number came from. So that, 
that's line one. There's no, um, uh, it had, you know, there's also a small component of fees, uh, 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 temporary uh, interest and in, uh, uh, some textbook rental in that. So as you can see, uh, from 20 to 21, you've got an, a little drop uh, coming, and then uh, from 25 through 26, uh, another drop. Convert that into your debt rate, and you, you, you know, your debt service rate is just shy of 50 cents. And you can see, again, just very level through uh, 2020, and then as the debt drops off, uh, it drops out to um, oh, you know, just maybe a little bit over 25, 26 cents. So you have the ability, that's the one not, that's the nice thing about that, yeah, eventually it comes off. It, you have the ability to um, and do some projects if you wish uh, and you know, keep that rate up. The thresholds <coughs> um, previous to 2018, just real quickly, from zero to two million dollars, uh, school corporations could um, uh, do projects uh, without petition or remonstrance or referendum. And then from two million to 10 million, uh, they would be subject uh, to um, uh, petition remonstrance. And then 10 million and over, they would be subject to um, referendum. Now I say that because it wasn't a mandatory, you know, if you do a um, you know, $7 million project, it's going to be petition and remonstrance. Or if you do a $12 million project, it's going to be a referendum. It was subject to taxpayers filing a petition to, um, uh, for the school corporation to either do one of those, uh, pick one of those methods. What changed in 2018 is um, the, um, the threshold became the lesser of 1% of your gross AV or $5 million. Um, the petition uh, remonstrance uh, is anywhere from 5 million to uh, 15, and then uh, you put 10 or 15 depending on um, your gross AV, uh, the uh, threshold for um, uh, referendum. So uh, in your case, this is Argus right here. I'm sorry? This is Argus right here. This is Argus right here. Yes. There are Our four taxing map. districts that make up the school corporation, four distinct, and each has their own uh, uh, rate um, and assessed value. So if you total those up, the gross AV is $230,793,090. So 1% of the gross AV is uh, just a little over $2.3 million. Um, that $5 million threshold beginning in 2019, um, there's a multiplier to it, and it's multiplied by the uh, assessed value uh, growth quotient, which is one point or uh, 3.4 percent. So it's the lesser of one percent of your gross AD or five million one seventy. So you can do projects up to two point three million dollars per building or per project or however um, without uh, petition uh, remonstrance. So that's the now is everyone do you understand your gross AD is close to the net AD? Is the gross AD is um, all of the assessed value in those townships. The net AV is the assessed value after all of the deductions. So there are some, there's a homestead, standard, mortgage, um, there's a veterans deduction, there are, you know, if you're um, blind and disabled, there's a, you know, the major ones are the supplemental, the homestead, and the mortgage deductions. So your gross AV as a community is 230 million. When you net that, or when you take all that out, it, what is it, 180? Yeah, it's, I was trying to recall. Yeah, so, yeah. so um, but the statute says, uh, you know, um, the statute would enable the 1% of 2.3 million. Yeah. So let's take a look, I think, we went through and looked at, um, there are three projects um, you may, um, you're, you're contemplating, I think project one, now I have to go this little, because I can see. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay, <laughs> you're fine. And we talked about the three, the, this yeah, separate so, parts here earlier. Yeah. So project one, we'll just call the, uh, 
the roofing uh, solar, and that's uh, two million two hundred and ten thousand dollars. That's an approximate. Yes. I'm sorry. These are all approximate. No. Appro yes, yeah, approximate. Um, so what I wanted with this budget, just a couple of things. Out of that two point two million, it's not all going to be used uh, or available for um, construction. There are going to be some costs of issuance associated. We're going to do a bond issue. There are going to be some costs uh, associated with that. So, um, and then there may or may not be capitalized interest. And I'll explain that with the next uh, slide. It really depends on the project, when you do it, uh, and what interest rates are. But um, as a placeholder, let's just assume that there is going to be capitalized interest. If there's not, then you either reduce the borrowing or what I've estimated is 155000 can go back up into construction. Okay, so but for now you're going to have you know some sort of you know construction account uh, cost uh, of issuance and capitalized interest. So um, there's project number one, the the roofing and solar. There was the auditorium uh, project um, and then uh, the drainage project. So three projects. Um, when you total all of them, it's 2.7 million. It's over the 2.3, but it's 2.3 per project okay so instead so you're looking at you know project number one is 2.2 we're looking at 230 for project number two and 320 for project number three um, instead of issuing three separate bond issues or trying to combine the two with one or the most cost effective uh, is to do one bond issue, one set of payments, one set of costs, and then that will fund three separate projects. So you get some efficiencies uh, by combining um, uh, the bond issue instead of trying to one, two, or three, or maybe trying to combine the other two, it won't be half a million dollars and trying to find buyers for half a million dollars. And Lord, as you head down the route here, we may, you may decide to do, as Damien was saying, look at this in separate projects so you can fund the whole thing. We may be able to put some operations money in there. And right. So there's different ways to do this, and these are rough estimates. I don't actually expect the auditorium and the drainage to cost that much, but we're just putting a number on it. You won't really know until you bid something. Yeah. Uh, I think the process that I that I always like is very similar to the way that the school budgets that you set a budget that's kind of an umbrella something that you're going to have to live with kind of a high number of a maximum etc and then like budgeting wise and then finally when you get your assessed value everything comes down so it'd be the same thing so we set a budget this project won't be any more than 2.7 million dollars uh, then we'll look at the payments etc um, and then if uh, I think the auditorium, you said maybe one hundred eighty thousand. Yes. If it's eight, if it's one hundred eighty thousand dollars, and there are other things we need done there. We can decide whether you, you do that or not. But yep. let's look at the max, and then we can tone it down to where it needs to be. So uh, yeah, and then um, before you issue debt, um, the project is starting here. Then it will get defined uh, by the time you actually um, uh, are ready. Uh, you know, we'll have a line itemization of the cost of issuance, we'll have a better handle on capitalized interest, and then hopefully you'll have you know, better than just guesstimates on construction and you know, maybe some uh, uh, better numbers. And then, um, prior to uh, issuing debt, we will have a, um, uh, a, um, uh, a closer number. Um, so, but for now, uh, 2760000 to fund three separate projects. So the proposed repayment would be, so let, if you sold bonds and there's, a, there's been a timetable, I think you got an, uh, an update. We have a proposed timetable. Yeah. I, I think I had looked at this at trying to sell bonds um, in, in May or June. Okay. And that's why you have that capitalized interest. So if we're looking at, what is that? It's more like August. Okay. Yes. Okay. The, so the draft here. Capitalized interest is was that $155,000 number that I had in the budget. 
So if you sold bonds in 2019, let's just say the summer of 2019, the first actual payment, interest payment, um, you wouldn't be, you, know, you wouldn't make until 2020 because you'd have to, you sold bonds this year, you don't, you would have had to appropriate the money last year to make a payment this year. You can't appropriate money for debt that you don't have. Exactly. And so here we are in 19, when you sell the bonds, when you go through your budgeting process, uh, we'll either have the bonds sold or we'll have a very good estimate of what that payment in 2020 would be. And you can see that I'm kind of th that payment right there is 155,000 based on today's market rates plus um, uh, 1%. I, I mean, was a, that is a conservative uh, number. Um, and so we would take that 155,000 that would be uh, from the bond issue and put with your local trustee, the bank. And so next year, when uh, bondholders get paid in July, the trustee gets, takes that money and pays those bondholders. Okay? And so when, and then you actually would start making a pretty end where you collect taxes you, you know, in 2021 where you have that little drop. And so if you can see the levy stays uh, you know, at that 900, or under actually that $900,000 uh, uh, max. And it's, uh, what is it, five, seven years? In seven years, it's paid off. And so what I like about this payment and this option as opposed to um, paying it out of the savings is in seven years, this project is done. We try to match the payment, the term of the bond issue the life of the asset. Okay. The classic example is you're not going to do a 10-year bond issue for technology and computers. Not going to that's, that makes no sense whatsoever because as soon, you know, within six months, you know, technology changes. So the projects that you're contemplating, curtains that have lasted you 20 years, yeah. are going to be this all the range stuff. The solar panels that you're going to put up that have a 20, that have a 35 year life. <laughs> Are you shaking? Um, that have Not a many 20, of us will probably be sitting here in 35 years. No, that, yeah, I'm just <laughs> seeing if he's awake. Yeah. They have a 40 year life <laughs> expectancy. Um, all of that, the roofing, all of that, um, the, the drainage, etc., cetera, um, you're going to pay off immediately, and then you still have use of it after that. Um, we could very easily take that 27 payment and kind of fill in so the 26 payment goes all the way up to that, um, to the red line. But I like this approach because in t you know, it, it gives a future board or an administration, maybe uh, 2024, 2025, if there's another pro you know, project or do something and kind of fit it in and keep the levy um, the same. And so when you get to you know, the rate, that rate stays, you know, at that, um, you know, 50 cent. And you're able to fund a project, pay it off quickly, keep, and then you have the, the use of that, of those assets uh, for well past their, you know, their, their uh, the bond issue in their life expectancy. The, um, these numbers, uh, and I think in your that AV was, what did I say? 160. So uh, there was no, um, I didn't try to make any uh, estimates or guesses uh, or use any growth uh, factor for your assessed value. I kept it at the uh, certified uh, 2019 number of 100, just shy of 160 million. So if your AV increases, that levy is going to be set 
your rate will come down. When you look at the overall, um, uh, when you look at your the debt, your operation, and your education right now. So this is kind of, again, worst case um, at, uh, you know, I've used a, a higher than normal interest rate. Uh, we're using a budget that you know, kind of a maximum $2.7 million budget. Um, you're looking at a maximum payment or term, uh, you know, seven years. Um, and it's all done, um, you know, uh, within the existing uh, 50 cent rate and that $900,000 levy. Okay, good. Board, any questions? Any questions? I know you've looked at this before, and it's the first time we've had Damien here. And I will make sure that Angie gets that, yes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, she just said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Anything more at this stage? So, the, so you've sort of seen the pieces of the project. You've seen the cost savings of the project, where money actually comes back to the school district, and given enough time, won't recoup all this money, plus no tax increase, and in how it phase in. And um, I appreciate the fact that you've overestimated, so it could do better than this, but it won't do worse than this. We can actually say we don't anticipate changing that that service tax rate at all if the board decides to do this. Sort of very short review of your more in-depth analysis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? If not, thank you, Damien. We will probably thank have you. some as we start this. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Any now we uh, item 10 we decided we're going to go ahead and with this proposal this project schedule so basically board you have a project schedule that I gave you that I have buried but I can find it a potential schedule and it would actually start a several month journey that we will continue to discuss this we will have public hearings on it there will be votes down the line and really not asking you to approve these projects this evening we're asking you to take this schedule, everything you heard, and start this journey through this process. There'll be many times for you to reconsider this and consider it further down the road as we continue to develop the numbers more specifically and timelines of that. So I would recommend, and I personally, as a longtime superintendent, retired superintendent several times, I think the right <laughs> thing to do is approve starting in on this schedule which starts you on a journey that can lead to all this but you'll see if the hearings and the resolutions and the motions and that are needed in the future in the next several months that's all we're going to do is start this journey as be my recommendation so we'll try to ask any questions we got the experts here but i'll sort of turn it over to you with a uh, timeline developed by bond council that if you decide to go this direction, this sort of starts this journey for future votes down the, down the road. Okay. Okay. Well, perhaps maybe before we open for discussion, we should get a motion to, for this proposed timetable in a second, then we can discuss. That'll work. I move we move forward with the proposed um, timetable as presented. I'll second. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Okay, so we do have a motion on the floor to consider this proposed timetable. Um, I'm just going to make a comment. It's not really a question, but perhaps I'm not seeing something, but we need the roof's attention, the drainage, we have to have to do it, the auditorium. These are things we need to do. And this energy savings is guaranteed to take care of it. We'll probably stand and make a little money on the side. I don't see a problem. <laughs> so, but maybe there's well, something I don't see. <laughs> and something that I'm really pleased with, we're not impacting the tax rate. Exactly. And I think that's really important for this community. And it helps assure the future of the school district into the future. So 
that's my feeling on it. I don't have a vote, but I need to bring you the information. And it's my understanding that we could stop this along the way if we needed to. Any step along the right. way if you learn something differently. Right. Ned, what was the town's response to the preliminary I, I, I met in the... Um, I met with um, Lisa and I talked to the town manager and told her that the board was going to start talking about this. And I told her that it can be a little downer to the town because this three million that we're going to save over the lifetime of this, that's revenue lost to the town because we're not going to buy as much power from them. Her comment was, well this sounds like really good for the school district and we're committed to this school district and really important so she says as a graduate from here and my family going here I'd be fully supportive of it and would they be willing to talk to the town about the town doing something like this <laughs> <laughs> so I told these gentlemen and she told me I could say that and so I haven't talked to everyone but I started there and she would share she said if I had any concerns they would have people here tonight and we've met with Jamie and the town on the drainage, drainage you know, and right. so they know about all this. So the town's been put in the loop. And, um, That's good. So, but I see this opening up a couple months. It's, I'd like anybody to ask questions. We'll try to answer the best we can. We're going to be fully transparent for it as mm -hmm. we head down and you face decisions along the way. And there will be public hearings when the public There will be public yeah. hearings every month as we go through this. And, as we go through the so there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to speak in the future. Um, uh, school council, we would anticipate yes, and I met with him today, and uh, he would work with uh, Jane Herndon and Eric Long of Ice Miller to execute a lease if you decide to proceed. How many solar projects do you have in play right now? Not up and running, but in this process right now? Uh, 10 or 12. In the state of Indiana? Throughout the state, yeah. And uh, you know, as Doug mentioned earlier, throughout the country, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Craig, you've done, I hate to guess how many solar projects you've done in the state of Indiana over the last few years. Mm -hmm. a bunch over the last four or five years. Many school districts. Many school districts. And municipalities. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. towns. Yeah. 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 He's the guy who's going to guarantee this, and we're going to come looking for him if you do it for it. He's going to write us a check if it doesn't work. He guarantees me it'll work. He's never written a check to anyone yet, have you? Because no. it's worked. And I'm not going to write one here. Run very fast. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. No, I, I believe you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? For the question, Angie, you got any questions? No, not this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, seeing no further questions, we'll call for a vote to go ahead with the proposed timetable for the project. Um, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. 4 0. Thank you. And you gentlemen are excused if you want to be because we have some more business to do this evening. Well, you're welcome to stay too. Or you're, you're welcome to stay. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Thank you for your help. Okay. The first item under our instructional report is a report from our Washington, D.C. and Europe trips. And as we get ready for our Europe trip, I'm just going to make a comment. Uh, over spring break, we took two major trips. I remember going one of them. <laughs> we went to Washington, D.C. with our eighth grader and some of our middle school students, and that was a successful trip. I want to report on that, but we, you guys. we do have students here that went to Europe and a mother chaperone here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I told them just spend a couple minutes. So um, I know the meeting's getting long, but we had a very successful trip. So I'm a fast talker. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Go for it. Glad the next slide. I just put some pictures together to share with you guys. Um, I know. Can introduce the students so just everyone knows? Yeah. Them. Yeah, please. Right. Or they can introduce themselves. Introduce yourself. Cole Norris. Baseball practice, they're coming. Yeah. Yes. Shane Stevens, Jr. Alan Wolf, Jr. Ian Kendrick, Sr. 
And I'm Nicole Stevens. I'm Shane's mom. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to share a few pictures with you. Um, got some of the kids there on the left um, in London and Abbey Road on the right. Go to the next slide. Um, here's Shane with all the ladies at Windsor Castle <laughs> and a picture of Windsor Castle with the moat around it. Um, Stonehenge, which was my favorite and what kind of caught me on about the trip is going to Stonehenge. And then all the kids um, posed in front of one of the big rocks of what it would have been like. You can see how large they are. Um, you can go on to the next one. Um, Salisbury Cathedral is one of my favorite. Um, we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time there, but we did get like a 30 minute tour. I got to see the Magna Carta. Um, our tour guide was really wonderful. She was pressed for time, but she um, gave us lots of little tidbits of things you wouldn't be able to look up online, uh, where sculptors got bored and in one corner there was a little monkey instead of the nice little pretty scrolls that should have been there. <laughs> and all kinds of little fun bits like that. And on the right is a picture of the reflecting pool. So that's actually water that just consistently drips over the edges and then that's a reflection of the stained glass window in there. Go to the next one. Um, St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, on the left, Shane can talk a little bit. Um, we had a wonderful tour guide in London, um, and the kids learned actually a lot from him, and super excited. Shane, you can tell us what's on the left So, St. Paul's Cathedral is, well, the one on the left is a uh, monument, like the top of St. Paul's Cathedral. It's uh, 365 feet tall for every day in the year. The St. Paul, Paul's Cathedral was built, it, it's like a church, so it, the Christopher Wren who built it, Try to incorporate that they pray to worship every day, so they build that for how many days a year. We built a talk. That's an mm -hmm. interesting factoid. Thank mm -hmm. you. And then the on the left, the um, the fire of 1666. The Great Fire of London in 1666. Mm -hmm. It burned down most of London, so that's why everything in London is made out of stone now, and that wood that they used mm -hmm. for it. And how many um, cathedrals and churches did Christopher Wren build? Christopher Wren built 49 churches and cathedrals and uh, one hospital. Mm -hmm. And what? And what's on his tombstone? They're learning their English history. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you want to see my memorial, look around. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you can go to the next one. Um, we went to Bath um, in England, and that is where the Roman baths are located. There's three natural water springs in England, and all of them are in Bath. So we got to tour and go down there. It was um, rediscovered in like the mid 1800s and they're still currently actually, it's all under the city. So they're still currently um, exploring more and rebuilding the structures so that we can go further. So if we ever get to go back, we could even see more than what we've already seen. And that group photo on the right of all of us there. And then the Tower of London, we've got Miss Jones and Trey on the left mimicking the uh, statues in the back. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to meet a new friend um, on the trip and as well as getting to know all the students better and not just experiencing all these things for the first time for myself but doing it as a group and seeing the kids learn and grow and 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 it, it I don't even guess I don't have all the right words to say of how special that truly was with the kids um, some selfies on the right with the um, Tower of London Bridge in the background there and um, another picture of the Tower of London Bridge the right photo is um, photo creds to Ian Kendig with his panoramic view there of the London nice. Tower. And then uh, we went on the Eye of London. So that was the group that was in our our uh, uh, pod as we went around. And uh, we got to, some of us went to Wicked, which I had never, I, I knew it kind of was about, but did not. Some of the kids got excited because I was like, oh! and then they're like, you didn't know this? I'm like, no. <laughs> so they got excited seeing me get excited. Um, so it's just a photos from the from Wicked and um, the Louvre Museum. So we've got our little selfie with Mona Lisa behind us back there. We kind of had to navigate. Good thing Shane's nice and strong. He navigated through the crowd so we could get as close as possible. And um, that's Mrs. Jones who were at Statue on the right. So we got that. Um, we have Cupid's Kiss, which I'm working on my BSN. And I actually had to do an article for that. So I was really excited to actually have wrote a paper and then get to see it in person and then Venus de Milo um, on the right. And then another Ian Kendig photo cred of the loop there. And um, Eiffel Tower at night. And, and you know, I got a six shade in there a few times. So um, during the day, <laughs> the next one. And then Notre Dame Cathedral, which we were there April 3rd. Um, so we've got the group picture on the left, photo on the right. 
I wanted to share some of these with you. you can go to the next slide. Um, the chandelier, um, and you can email this out if you want a better view of it or if any of you want this to, to see, you're more than welcome to it. Um, one of the stained glass windows in the cathedral. And then um, more pictures of the inside. They don't show up as good on the projector, but. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, what it looks like today, this afternoon yeah, around so 1 p.m. So it was a life-altering trip. Um, over half the students, there's 35 students that went, and then the rest of us were teachers or a few parents. Total, total approximately 50 people. About 48. Yep, 48 of us. Um, half Over half of them had never flown before. So we're leaving Chicago to Heathrow, getting on a bus, going to Paris, back to um, uh, Chicago. Uh, we did have a, a wonderful time. There was a little traffic. So we did have a home alone moment <laughs> in the airport where we were running. At first, Mrs. Carroll was like, everybody waited at the terminal, and I kind of had a, a group of kids where all their parents individually had said, just will you watch, just keep an eye out. I said, we're getting on that plane. <laughs> we'll, they'll be easier to fit 10 of them on another plane than 48 of us all in a whole other plane. And then she texted us and said, just get on the plane. But we all made it at 11.14, Mrs. Carroll got on the plane, door shut, and we took off at 11.15 for our way home. So, um, wonderful, wonderful experience. I hope the school gets to continue to do that. Um, I highly recommend it. The, the company we went with was really good. Um, you know, there's always hiccups here or there, but they were wonderful. And always, we have other yeah, people. Yeah, it's, it's impossible to be I do perfect. want to share a thing with the students that I've heard back about you. You know, people always report them, kids. <laughs> <laughs> and this is really good. It's the largest first time group they've ever had. For a small school district, that's very impressive. Mm -hmm. And they said, without exception, some of the best behaved students mm -hmm. they've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. And had nothing but praise for you. And that doesn't mean you weren't a little ornery. No. <laughs> yeah. But it is really nice to hear compliments mm -hmm. on you and compliments about your behavior and uh, showing maturity. And I do want the, did want the board to hear that because they wouldn't have had it told me good news. Right. They did. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. And what a lifetime event for all of them. Mm -hmm. Yep, it was very momentous for all of us, and all the kids had a great time. So, we so really, do you have anything you want to say? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, um, I thought it was really cool with the teachers going. Like, at first, it was like, oh, great. A ton of teachers you, have teachers and, you have teachers and a principal, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. So, and he was in the principal's group. So. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really cool kind of seeing them not at school, like more yep. relaxed and like, you just got to see a different side of them that you're not used to seeing. And well, even like they the thought it was sort of nice more. seeing you and the students yeah. in a different room. <laughs> so I went both directions. <laughs> Good. Anybody else? Uh, nothing. It's already been said. Pullman? Maddie? No? So you'd recommend it for future students? Then? Most Absolutely. definitely. Um, it worked out really well for a lot of people with the fundraising options that we did individually, plus you could promote your own web page that they gave you to have family members donate for Christmas or birthdays or any of that and it was broke up over a nice period of time to make payments easy and um, it was a, a great experience and I'm really fortunate I always wanted to go and I'm, I'm happy that Shane let me go with him really he doesn't know if he wouldn't have got to go if I didn't get to go <laughs> so it wasn't gonna happen <laughs> but well we're glad you got the opportunity and we appreciate you taking the time mm -hmm. to uh, share a little yep. bit yep thank you it's a big step forward for Argus it is it's huge I yes. yeah it's phenomenal thanks thank you Thank you. Thank you. I, I actually saw a Facebook post. It was, I had no idea who it was. Probably a former student. Some comment about, oh, I wish we got opportunities like this. So, I mean, it just tells you that we're continuing to move forward and trying to provide these opportunities for our students. Um, it doesn't mean that 15 years ago they didn't want to, but it, we just have to keep moving forward. But we can provide these opportunities in a small school district for our kids just like other school districts. Mm -hmm. You don't have to miss out on things. Mm -hmm. It's a big world out there. I'm glad you got a chance to see it. And they learned so much. I can tell. Yeah. I've heard him talk. Shane was very excited because the uh, tour he, guide he, said, he was awesome. yeah, he kept calling, is that Shane back there? We're, he's in the back of us. Yeah. And you would look at him. I got a report on that too, Shane. Yeah. He had a job, but he's pretty smart. <laughs> All right, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Park D. Uh, the kids did really well.
say, that was important to me. Yeah, I will go and say, um, Peyton also went on a trip to, I don't know if you have anything to say. Um, like Mickey said, there were some hiccups. Yeah, with and the we learned about that. Company. But overall, I think it went really well, and I think, I know I'd go back again, even if it was with that company. They still did well. Okay. Good. Good. Well, we're glad to give our kids these opportunities. We want to continue to do that in the future for those that are interested. Okay, now, approval of transfer students. Yeah, the state of Indiana requires school districts every year to set a transfer policy. Since back in the day, you couldn't transfer students, but today there's open transfer. Mm -hmm. So every school district needs to set a policy, and you can't cherry pick is what it was called well that's a good student i'll take them and this student's in trouble i won't take them you either got to be open or not open and open for everybody and what we did a year ago board we set uh, open enrollment um, starting in the summer and it stayed open until the adm count day which is the funding day and then we closed it if you live if you move in you're always welcome but you can't jump from one school district to another because after the count day, if you're going to another school district and you get upset with them, decide you want to come over here, then they get the funding and we educate them for nothing for the year. And so this forces people or encourages people to make that decision so we get the funding. So what I would recommend is doing it the same as we did last year that we had opened enrollment from June 1 to September 1, 2019. Anyone that wants to apply, they're welcome. After that, it'll be people moving into our district or actually coming here to live or showing a rental agreement or moving in. We did this this past year. It, it still had a growth in enrollment and it helped us with staffing and that that we don't get inundated in areas after school has started. So the state of Indiana requires the board to take action and we have to report this by May 17th. So that's why it's on the agenda for tonight. So I would recommend doing the same we did a year ago. We will open up enrollment. In fact, we have people wanting to come now and we'll say, yes, we'll sign you up and you can come start a next school year and we're ready to go. But the official enrollment time will be uh, June 1 to September 1. Always open for business for anyone who lives in our community. So. And we also have many students placed here by other school districts. That will still continue because we're educating kids in partnerships with other school districts. But what this really keeps is like uh, the other day I had a kid that was expelled from a local school district for drugs and he showed up and wanted to go to school here. Well, if you don't have this, we would have to take it. Well, I want to enforce that other school district's discipline. Uh, I think a drug, we don't really need to have a drug dealer from another school district enroll here. And so this enables us they can come during the summer or they want to come here and get a great education we'll give them one but if you're just avoiding discipline at another school district during the school year probably not a real good idea for Argus we'll ask them to get their act together and then they can come to school here so I recommend approval June 1 to September 1 we'll go on our websites go out on our information and we'll start taking the new ones I do have a part C after you get done with the oh, okay. instruction okay thanks is there a motion to approve the transfer student dates as presented? Thank you. And a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, any questions? That would be for approving June 1st through September 1st, 2019 for the transfer students. Any question? Okay, all in favor, signify with an aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. And Part C. Board, one thing that we haven't had here at Argus that I've had in other school districts and I want to implement it. It's very cost effective, but I found it to be very helpful. Uh, kids, when they, they see things with bullying, they see things with depression, they see th kids that are threatening violence, but there's a code among kids. You don't tell people. And so what I'm bringing to your attention is called the Safe School Helpline, which is an app that can go on kids' phones and staff phones, and it's an anonymous call line where they call in and give a tip. Hey, you better, so-and-so's depressed. So-and-so's being bullied. 
and we never ask their names and it's an anonymous tip line but it really helps us protect students because we find out things we can't find out in other ways and um, the cost is 82 cents per kid for a year well that's a great investment 82 cents to have an anonymous tip line when there's something going on that we need to know about uh, we're showing some There'll be posters put up all over the schools. Every home will have a magnet sent home with the website and the number on that can be put on the fridge. The kids will have this in their lockers. They can put it on their phones if they want to. It's all free. But when they have a friend that's in trouble, there's something going on with violence, there's bullying, uh, they're being mistreated in some way, they can call us anonymously. We don't ask names, but it gets assigned a case number we can report back through and we can get the proper help to these kids and it just opens up lines. Kids know one of their buddies is in big trouble. They won't tell us, but they will call us and tell us anonymously on a tip line their buddy's in trouble and we can address it. And it's actually, I know for a fact in schools I've had in the past, this has saved lives and it's saved violence and that. And 82 cents a day is a great, 82 cents a year per kid is a great investment. We're looking at about $400 a year to have this available to our kids, our community, and our staff. So break the silence, talk about it, save a life, and the fact they don't have to when they're reporting an issue and reporting some kid in trouble, it's anonymous. And he's, what comes up? Well, some kid's going to just give you a bunch of nothing and they're going to tell a lie about something. Well, that's why you always investigate it, you always check, and you don't take their word for it. But we have found out over the years when it's anonymous like that, there, there's a lot of important information, and we have gotten professionals involved. Uh, we've even, I've even confiscated a weapon or two being tipped off. There's a weapon in a locker. And uh, they can't, they don't have the courage to tell you that in person, but boy, Anything that we can do for safety of our kids, it's a good investment. It'll be put on our website, it'll be sent home to all schools, and so you will see a lot of this coming forward. But I wanted to explain to the board an instructional report, we're going to go ahead with this, just the whole idea of improving our safety and security for students and staff. It's called the Safe School Helpline. I will be sending you information board. I just wanted to give you an alert that we are implementing that and it will be coming very cost effective and it will make us safer with our SRO starting next week our safe school helpline we're moving forward with school security and they can text you can text it you, you know can they can the barely make a phone call no <laughs> and the phone calls for us adults right we, we, we call but the kids text because they want I mean yeah and, and the, the kids have an app on their any phone any kid can put it on their phone it's a free app they hit the app, they'll type in their concern, we will see it, and um, let's say they want a response back to the kid, we don't know who the kid is, but a number is assigned to it, we will respond to that, and it has that assigned number, the company then responds back to the kid. Here's what the administration found out when they looked into it. And then the kid can give us, and we. Can, I've already said, hey, we need more information, that comes back again and it can go back and forth but it protects the anonymous just like uh, the police use with their tip lines this is a safety tip line it actually works because in the code of kids not to have to stand up and give their name we find out things that we really need to know to help other kids who's going to be the gatekeeper here is that you the is gatekeepers are however we assign it and what i've done in the past is i've had everything come through the superintendent so I know it's not out there inappropriately. And then it's assigned to principals or guidance counselors as needed, or police as needed. But, uh, and they will call me 24 hours a day when they have something, especially if it's a violence thing, or a kid's in danger mentally or emotionally. And we will take action 24 hours a day. We will investigate. We're not accusing anybody of anything. We don't know if it's true or not true. But just having that piece of information and making sure it's safe for the individual kid, group of kids, the whole school, it's just a tool we do not have right now. And if you think kids will just come up and tell you about it, it they know things. 
<laughs> they know a lot of things, but getting them to share it with us so we can make things safe. And we also get teachers and adults that tip us, parents that tip us too. Parents know something about a kid or know something about a home situation. You don't get a lot of calls, but I'd say in an average school year, you're going to get about 20, 30 calls. <coughs> Maybe one every other week, at maximum one a week. But of that number, of those, if you got 20 or 30, I would say 15 to 20 of them can save somebody's life. And boy, if you save one kid's life, 82 cents is a great investment. So I just wanted to bring it to your yeah. attention, board. Would that go into effect soon or next school year? We're going to do a two-month <coughs> trial basis this year. And what we've negotiated, it's a yearly thing, runs July 1 to June 30th. But by starting it now, they're going to give it to us the same price. So we're getting 15 months instead of 12 months for the same price. So we'll have an initial kick-in this spring and then a full blown introduction of it when school starts next year. Are you doing the convocation with the kids? We will be having, yes, yeah, so there will be meetings and conversations and we'll be putting stuff out on our website and <coughs> sky alerts to the parents how it works and there'll be things coming home. But I didn't mm -hmm. want to do any of that until I had a chance to. So if you see Safe School Helpline, you know what we're about and I will send you, I will send you personally all this information ahead of time in your packets. Great. Just informational for now. Okay, item 12. We have some donations that we need to approve from uh, Gentech Farm and Van Adco, Midwest Spring, Argus Old Gold Boosters, and First Source Bank. Those are the ones that have come through the proper channels so far. Yes, <laughs> we love donations. <laughs> yes. I move those donations be approved as presented. Thank you. Second. Okay, thank you. We move for the second. <coughs> Any discussion on the on the uh, donations? I'm guessing BPA is off the nationals. Uh, I assume so. Yes. No kids go. Mm -hmm. There'll be more coming too. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, all in favor of accepting those donations with an aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Claims. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer. Hey. We've been waiting, right? Let's, let's pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. uh, our claim docket for this month is $569,715.02. That includes payroll and accounts payable. Okay. I move we approve claims as presented. Thank you. I'll you have a motion? I'll second. Second. Thank you. Okay, any discussion or questions for Jennifer? Okay, all in favor of approving claims as presented with an aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, financial reports. Looks like we have some slides. Yeah, just a few slides and we won't take much time here because times we're running a little long this evening. But here's our revenue. We show that every month. That really isn't changing. But the next slide is we will go to um, this is our educational fund expenditures. And you can see we're a quarter of the way through the budget year as we got through March and we spent 22%, 25%, so we're about 3% to the good. And so the educational fund's looking very positive and you can see the very positive trend board you've accomplished in the last several years. So our finances on the educational fund, which pays for all the uh, instruction and all our teachers and all the salaries, looks good. Next slide is our operation fund. And I told you this would be correcting, and it, mm -hmm. it is. We're now at 24%, we're 1%, man, and so that looks really healthy as we look a quarter of the way through the school year, so mm -hmm. keep watching this. I wanted to show you our reserves. That's a question that's been asked to me several times. Well, what's our rainy day fund reserves, and what's the history? Well, there's the history. As of today and as of the end of March, we had 721000 $314 in rainy day and we're not having any plans to spend that. If we have an emergency, it's there. But that's a good place for it to be. And we've also been able to increase that. And our total cash reserves, you can see over the years here, uh, we're at 3.2 million and change right now. There's really some good news there. You see a little downward trend, but remember we did a $900,000 project and it didn't go down 900,000 which right. shows we're still building reserves. So that's really healthy for the district. And 
So superintendent, I feel really good about our reserves and our financial status as we look. And Definitely. That's totally different than what we talked about earlier tonight, but this is what's really important. This is the financial stability of the school district. So that's my financial report. The 2017 bond really is what drove those large yes. increases. Yes, and the bonds. parts that we Exactly. We put some yeah, of that in a rainy day with some of the cash, mm -hmm. and some of it we transferred into the general, and right. so we didn't spend all that. Right. But we did spend approximately nine hundred thousand to a million of it on our projects. But the rest we've kept in reserves, which was good business, but poor. Correct, Jim. Okay. Uh, comments for our superintendent. Superintendent's done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, and uh, from the board. Anything down there? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I guess just the timetable that we all looked at, I think we're starting on the right path to, to do this. I echoed Monty's comments earlier that these are all things that have to be done. We're not going to do this building project, upgrade our bathrooms, or do our new carpet to have the roof fall in. I mean, <laughs> We have to do these things. Needs to be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. And if we can uh, secure that uh, for the foreseeable future, um, that makes me feel good as a board member. And two, the uh, uh, trip to Europe uh, planning is underway for a trip to Belize in 2021. Just seeing if there's an And there's yes. a parent student meeting Wednesday night. So I'll attend that and see what. And if we see that there's interest in the students in the community, then we will bring it back to you because we just right we approved just the indication the indication yeah. but maybe that but so what we'd like, like to do is sort of get in a rotation so kids have a couple of experiences they come through and if they want to participate great if they don't want to that's fine too but it's a big world out there and trying to expose our kids in a very positive way to a bigger world and see a bigger situation so i think we certainly learned that that was a positive thing for our kids to have an opportunity to do. Thank you. Okay. Well, I just have a couple things. Uh, I know Ned always gives credit to the board for accomplishing things, but I think we all know who the real master is behind this, and we sure appreciate you. I appreciate Argus. That's about okay. that. And uh, the second thing, uh, concerning the Europe trip, with my background, you know how I feel about the ed educational value of travel and I'll just share my daughter went on the trip and I'll probably embarrass her but how many school librarians have ridden some sort of a, I don't know it was a hoverboard skate roller type thing around the courtyard of the Louvre Museum <laughs> that's probably a pretty small number <laughs> okay so anything further okay we'll take a motion for adjournment uh, Angie, do you have any comments? almost forgot you were on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. Um, I thought it was a very productive meeting tonight. I hope everybody takes the information and we go forward. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you for joining us tonight electronically. Mm -hmm. oh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Now I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move to adjourn. Okay. And do we have a second? Thank you. And all in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Okay. And eight. I was looking at the clock. Thanks. Sorry. Eight forty. Thank you. Thank you, community, for hanging in there. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, that it came. We kept you up a little later tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Angie.